So this story begins in 1974. That's me, in my home community of Bethel's Beach, which is a beautiful rural community on the west coast of New Zealand. Nature herself was like a first childhood teacher to me, and the bond I forged with nature would lead me to start three climate tech funds. 49 years later, anomalously warm water powered New Zealand's first ever Category 3 cyclone. It had no mercy on Bethel's. Sadly, much of the damage was permanent. And even today, the residents are still clearing up. Cyclone Gabriel didn't just change my homeland, it changed me as I set about establishing CH4 Capital. Now it was personal. And I didn't know it at the time, but my question, what can I do to protect my home community, was going to lead me to Bitcoin, which is counterintuitive to some people. But imagine a world where Bitcoin is being used at scale to reduce emissions and climate change. Inching us forward closer to that reality has been the focus of my last year. And as well as being very good for the planet, it's also, it turns out, very good for Bitcoin. In that the $23 trillion currently in ESG funds around the world that cannot allocate to Bitcoin can deploy a wider percentage of their AUM, which is also good for Bitcoin's market cap. Now, right now, Bitcoin's market cap is tiny. I checked it this morning. It's $560 billion. Now, relative to the other buckets that the wealthy and institutional investors put their wealth and value into, it really needs to be above that $1 trillion threshold in order for these institutionals who hold the wealth of sovereign nations and pension funds to feel comfortable deploying into. So, what would 1% additional of AUM from these ESG funds into Bitcoin do to Bitcoin's market cap? Well, thanks to Willy Woo, we can estimate this within a range. At today's increase in market cap per dollar invested, 1% of additional AUM to Bitcoin would have the consequence of raising Bitcoin's market cap to 1.68 trillion, which happens to be exactly trillion, exactly three times what it was this morning. Okay, a more aspirational goal. What if 2.5% of AUM for these ESG funds around the world deployed into Bitcoin? It would lift Bitcoin's market cap to 3.3 trillion. Now, you may be thinking, but is that realistic short term? Well, let's find out. Over the last years, I've been an impact investor. That means that part of my job involves looking for technologies that not only get a return on investment, but are good for people and planet. I've seen over 200 climate tech technologies, and of those, Bitcoin is the most measurable, far-reaching, and fast-acting climate tech I've ever seen. And that's important because right now, these ESG funds around the world have a problem. Demand for solid ESG propositions actually outstrips supply, which means that Bitcoin is in prime position to be the answer to this problem. But only if two things happen. The first is well-socialized data, and the second is a new type of action. Let's start with data. Now, there are currently four major reasons that ESG funds around the world feel uncomfortable deploying into Bitcoin. You've probably heard some of these perceptions yourself. The first one is, and this is a perception, Bitcoin is mainly powered by fossil fuels and it proliferates the use of fossil fuels. Second, Bitcoin has high emissions and as Bitcoin increases in size, emissions is going to go parabolic. Thirdly, Bitcoin has high and rising emission intensity. And finally, Bitcoin's major fuel source is coal. 
Now, these perceptions don't come out of nowhere. They come from somewhere, and they happen to come from the media. But again, the media reports don't come out of thin air. They come from somewhere, so where do they come from? Well, these four came from studies by Cambridge. 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 And can you guess? <laughs> Brilliant. So let's get this straight. 23 trillion in ESG funds around the world cannot deploy into Bitcoin because of four perceptions formed by media. These four perceptions are based on one study. That's one heck of a link in the chain. Maybe we should look a bit closer at this study. So to Cambridge's credit, They've been transparent both with their model methodology and the limitations of their model. This is from their website. It says, our current mining map may not represent the latest status quo. That's academic prose for we may be out of date. OK. Well, how much out of date? A week? A month? More? When you're modeling something dynamic, such as Bitcoin mining, continuously updated data is the heartbeat of your model. Here's what the Cambridge heartbeat looks like. It lost its pulse in January 2022. And you might think, well, is that significant? Well, back in January 2022, Kazakhstan, an almost entirely fossil fueled nation, had over 13% of global hash rate. Today, less than 1%. This is significant. But it turns out there's an even bigger problem. Again, from Cambridge's website, the Cambridge model does not include off-grid mining. OK. So around a year ago, I spent some time developing a ground-up model which included the impact of off-grid mining on the Bitcoin network. I called it BEAST, Bitcoin Emissions and Energy Sustainability Tracker. It brings the model up to date and includes off-grid and on-grid mining. Here's what we found. That we know of, there are currently 52 off-grid Bitcoin mining companies. They represent 28% of hash rate, and they use almost 80% sustainable energy, which shouldn't really surprise us because these days, they're chasing cheap electricity, and these days, most of that cheap electricity is going to be renewable, sustainable based. So what happens when we factor this into the model and bring the mining map up to date? Well, before we answer that question, two very important bits of context. The first is that on the 31st of August this year, Cambridge made this acknowledgement that for two years, they had been overestimating energy consumption of the Bitcoin network, and their model was likely still overestimating emissions. Okay? Two weeks later, mark the date, Bloomberg Intelligence drop the Cambridge model and start using Beast, saying this. So now we have, for the first time, a transparent, up-to-date model which includes on-grid and off-grid miners, which is recognized by a third party, which is highly trusted to the investment committees of this world. And what does it tell us? It tells us four things. Firstly, Bitcoin is more than 50% powered by sustainable energy. This makes it, as an industry, the highest user of sustainable energy in the world. Second, Bitcoin's emissions have not grown for the last four-year cycle. Now, this is significant not only to institutional investment, but to mining policy, including the proposed proof-of-work ban in the EU. The White House Office of Science and Technology has said that in order to form favorable Bitcoin mining policy, they need an assurance that as the network grows, emissions do not get out of hand. Well, we now have that data. You can throw any growth metric you want at it. Hash rate, user growth, price, all more than doubling over a four-year period, and yet emissions has not grown, making Bitcoin the only industry in the world which has successfully decoupled industry growth from emission growth. Third, 
Emission intensity, this is a measure of emissions per unit of energy. This is halved over the last four years to the point where it is now the lowest of any industry in the world. And finally, Bitcoin's major fuel source is... No. Hydro! That's right, the Bitcoin network is powered by falling water. Now, to compare and contrast, both Bitcoin and EVs are zero emission networks in that they have zero emissions directly, but both of them have indirect emissions because they use electricity, which is sometimes powered by fossil fuels. The only difference is that in Bitcoin's case, most of that power is coming from hydro, the predominant user, whereas in EV's case, it's predominantly coal. So these four findings mean that this article, this article, this article, and this article are all incorrect. But not just incorrect, but they've falsely indicted a technology which has achieved four environmental firsts that remain unique to any industry globally. I regularly get told by people, hey, I've used your charts to ESG someone, and more recently that someone has been an investment committee. That's good, keep on using the charts in that way. Of course, now is the time to share this new narrative and this new data. Yes, the re-education process will take time. It's always harder to re-educate people than to educate from scratch. But the prize for doing so is big. Truth is on Bitcoin's side, and now that truth is a little more transparent. It's quite possible that by socializing this new data, that could be responsible for 1% AUM deployment of this 23 trillion of ESG funds around the world. But I don't believe it'll take us further than that unless something else happens. So what is that something else? Well, that's action. And what action? Well, we've already been told. We've been told both by the antagonists of Bitcoin and also the ESG committees themselves. ESG investment committees have said, if you could demonstrably show that you could do this, then it would be a no-brainer. It meaning deploying further into Bitcoin. The White House Office of Science and Technology has said, this form of Bitcoin mining can help meet the US administration's climate objectives. And the IMF, the IMF policy lead said, this is by far the most compelling argument for Bitcoin. So what are they all talking about? Methane mitigation. And why is this so important? Well, it's so important because right now, methane mitigation is our strongest lever to reduce climate change, according to the UN. It's 84 times more powerful than carbon dioxide over a 20-year period, growing at a parabolic rate, and yet very little has been done about it. And while I can't prove it, I suspect strongly that the reason that my home community was scarred by a Category 3 cyclone was that on top of a linear increase in carbon dioxide emissions, our world was trying to cope with that happening to our methane. It turns out that by 2032, our largest storehouse of anthropogenic methane could be landfills. But like a lot of things, unless we can mitigate that methane profitably, it's not going to happen, which is why, for the most part, it hasn't happened. So how do you mitigate landfill methane profitably? Well, where possible, you take that landfill gas, you purify it, you send it to a generator, generate electricity. Then you have to do something with that electricity. Well, the problem is that for a lot of landfills around the world, they need a major grid upgrade for the grid to be able to handle that electricity. It's just not economically viable, or government policy prevents it. So I asked Nuno Barbosa, who's been doing landfill gas power generation for 20 years now, how many of the world's landfills have no option to sell power back to the grid? He said, 50%. Okay. 
So what if these landfill owners had an on-site customer? He said that would change everything. But who could that on-site customer be? I mean, they'd have to be location agnostic. And they'd have to have electricity being such a high percentage of their operational budget that it would make sense to invest all that extra capex to chase cheap electricity. If it were not for Bitcoin and it were not for Bitcoin mining, we would have no customer that fitted that profile in the entire world. But we do. Bitcoin miners love the idea of using landfill gas. That's one of the reasons they love it. Even Marathon's recently published a report on Bitcoin mining on landfills. Landfill owners love the idea. It gives them extra revenue. Bitcoin mining companies want to do it. Landfill owners want to do it. So why isn't it happening? Well, they've lacked the marriage celebrant in the middle, the financing to make it happen, which is why we decided to make our third fund an infrastructure investment fund specializing in landfill gas-powered Bitcoin mining. Because unless we make methane mitigation profitable, the level of methane mitigation that our planet needs is not going to happen, and all our other climate efforts may be insufficient. Bitcoin mining can make methane mitigation profitable on up to half the world's landfills. In a twist worthy of a John le Carre novel, what I, I and other environmentally minded people thought was the villain turns out to be the good guy. So, methane is our strongest lever to reduce climate change, and for vast swathes of that methane, Bitcoin mining is the only technology that can make that profitable. Okay, that's significant. Once again, this is not only good for the planet, it's also really good for Bitcoin. Here's how. You may not know this, but right now, there is a particular type of vented methane or flared methane-based Bitcoin mining, which is mitigating 6% of Bitcoin network emissions. 6%. That's extraordinary. That's 6% more than any other industry on the planet. Two-thirds of the reason it's that high is because of one company, Cruzo Energy, who do flare gas mitigation in the oil and gas industry, using high-performance computing and Bitcoin mining as the users of that power. Okay. So, what would happen if we added... Oh, by the way, these charts have been seen for the first time. We embargoed them especially for Legano so we could reveal them. So thanks for Antonius from Blockbrain for making these available to us. There's an even better story we can tell, though. If we take the emissions of just four landfills, four venting landfills, and we put Bitcoin mining on them, here's what would happen. We would triple Bitcoin's emission mitigation with four landfills. That's enough to offset the emissions of Geneva. <laughs> it also turns out that this is the world's biggest direct air capture project ever run. It mitigates 4,000 tonnes of CO2 equivalent emissions every year. With four venting landfills powered by Bitcoin mining, we can do four million tons of CO2 equivalent in just one year. That's a thousand times more than the biggest direct air capture project ever run. But what if we take it a bit further? We wouldn't want to stop at four, right? What if we did, say, 35 venting landfills and put Bitcoin mining operations on them? If we did that, that would be enough to take the entire Bitcoin network emission negative. The first industry in the world to have achieved such a feat without using offsets. So how much capital will this take? Well, in Crusoe's case, to do their 4%, it took $505 million. However, 
So if we use that formula, then to go to 100% would take $12 billion. But we can do it differently to cruise our energy. If we focus on venting landfills only, if we focus on Bitcoin mining only, we don't do it for $12 billion because using vented methane mitigates 10 times the amount of fled methane, we can do it for just over $400 million. And this is not a cost, this is an investment that we're projecting return on. <laughs> but there's another side to this story too. Methane doesn't just impact the planet, it harms human lives. Every single year, there are one million premature deaths due to methane. That's as much as the number of people who died in the last year due to suicide and COVID combined. Here's one example. This is the landfill in Haiti. It's not a landfill, it's an open dump. The people you can see there, they're scavengers. There's two to 3,000 of them that spend most of their lives on the landfill, earning about $3 a day, scavenging what they can get to resell. This is Shang Lier, one of the scavengers. He's 41 now. He's been doing this work since he was 12. Women and men do this work long into the night. This is Shang Lier again. He's managed to make a makeshift gas mask for himself to spare himself the worst of the methane inhalation. And this is his wife, Violine. Her dream is to have a nice home. When asked to elaborate, she said, one where I don't have to hold up tarps when it rains. This is where they live. Most of the people living here through chronic methane inhalation have both headaches and chronically and respiratory illnesses. Because of the scavenging, they also get jabbed by used syringes which give them infections. Because they live right next to the landfill, the children are also exposed. Babies who are born here are more likely to be born with birth defects. The waste from the landfill, which is an open dump, is not contained, so it does seep into the soil and into the drinking supply, the water supply of the locals. This is the pickers walking through the smoke that got caused when the rubbish was burnt, resulting in dioxins which they inhale directly. We can take methane that's killing people and turn it into methane that transforms communities. Stop the waste seeping into the water. Give the people a living wage. Give them proper tools and equipment as well. Earning a living wage doing waste separation. And the phenomenal thing about this is that the carbon credits that this project fetch will earn a premium because of the social impact that it has at the same time. That premium is more than enough to cost, to handle the cost of this additional work. Yep, carbon credits and Bitcoin mining, they're kind of like a Nick Cave and Kylie Minogue duet. You wouldn't expect them to work, but somehow they just do. What we're doing here is we're taking an emission that harms the planet and people and we're alchemizing it into a power source for sound money. Now remember, what we're talking about here is just one of the environmental benefits of Bitcoin. We haven't even talked about the grid decarbonization benefits or the benefits of going beyond a consumption-fueled fiat economy. And this is just the E part of ESG. We haven't even talked about the massive social benefits or governance benefits. You know, there's barely a day that goes by when I don't ask myself, how did I end up doing this? There are people who know more about Bitcoin than me, better connected to capital markets or nation state leaders than me. But then I remember my home community and this the way it used to look before the cyclone, and that spurs me on. When I was a child living in Bethel's Beach, my mother would read me a story called The Lorax, one of my favorites. There's a line in there that goes, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better, it's not. 
The you in that story is the same you that I'm talking about too. It's you. I'm a little bit older than that guy in the picture now. We all are. But I believe none of us have lost our enthusiasm for standing up for what we believe in. And Bitcoin is worth everyone believing in, including the ESG funds of this world, because Bitcoin is not just number one across one meaningful environmental metric, but six. And that's why I say that Bitcoin is the greatest and best ESG asset in the world. Thank you. Thank you.